We're going to be talking about a very uh, Jewish holiday uh, today called Purim. Or uh, I'm a Texan, I call it Purim. So the Feast of Purim, it comes from Esther. Now to open up the, get to the stage set, there was a king of the Persian Empire by the name of Ahasuerus, and his queen was Vashti. Well, Queen Vashti, she publicly disrespected the king, and so he had her publicly dethroned. Very strict times in the Persian Empire. So the king wanted to find another queen. So he said, let's get all these women together and bring them in. And whoever pleased the king the most got to take over Vashti's place as queen. Kind of like our big kingdom-wide beauty pageant, so to speak. So there was a Jewish man named Mordecai. He lived within the kingdom. And Mordecai raised up his uncle's daughter as his own daughter. And her name was Esther. That's where we get the book of Esther, okay? So Esther was required to enter into this pageant that the king was having. Uh, But Mordecai said, keep it a secret that you're Jewish. Don't tell anybody that you're a Jew. So she goes into the pageant. Now, who do you think won the whole pageant? I mean, this girl must have been hot, okay? She won the whole thing. Esther 2 and 7 says the king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Okay, so here you go. Here's, here goes our story. Interesting, though, that Esther had no desire to win. <laughs> she didn't even want to go to this contest, but apparently God had his own plans for her to be put in that position. So now, bam, Mordecai's daughter, Esther, she is the queen of the entire Persian empire now. So. After this happened, though, Mordecai just happened. You say just happened. God made it happen. But Mordecai just happened to hear two men who were plotting to kill the king. Esther 2 and 22. So the matter became known to Mordecai, who told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. And when an inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed, and both were hanged on a gallows. Okay, so now Mordecai saved the king's life. Now, there's this other man that the king had recently promoted to the office of prime minister. His name was Haman. Haman was a descendant of King Agag. He's got Gag right in the middle of his name, right? He was a descendant of King Agag, who was king of the Amalekites. Now, who are the Amalekites? The Amalekites are those cowards that attacked Israel from the back where the older people, the, maybe the, the more sick, the younger people attacked them from the back while Israel was on their way out of Egypt. So a little side story real quick. We need to understand the background of these Amalekites so that we can understand Haman. So Moses had the military commander at his time, Joshua. He had the, him defend the Israelites. Watch this, Exodus 17, 13. So Joshua defeated Amalek, see the Amalekites. Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called its name, the Lord is my banner. For he said, because the Lord has sworn the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Okay, guys, as from this story alone, you can tell it just ticks God off to no end 
when people mess with Israel, all those nations messing with Israel, they are going to answer to the Lord God in the same way. But you can tell that the Lord does not like the Amalekites for what they did. The Amalekites are sworn enemies of God's people Israel. So now you see the problem now, don't you, between Haman and Mordecai. They are going to be the sworn enemy guys because of this event that happened to Israel. But you've got Mordecai, he saved the king's life, and now the king's prime minister is an Amalekite. You've got two prominent guys in the kingdom right under this king, and both are going to have a problem. But that's why it was wisdom for Mordecai to tell Esther to keep her Jewish identity secret. Don't tell anybody that you're a Jew. Esther 3 and 1. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of whoever, put the hammer down, Hamadatha, the Agagite, see, he was an Ag of Ag Agag, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. And all the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman, for so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were within the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? Now it happened when they spoke to him daily, and he would not listen to them, that they told it to Haman to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay him homage, Haman was filled with wrath. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy, get this guys, read this, read this. Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the entire kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. So he's going to kill every Jew in the entire kingdom. Do we have a map next? Uh, it was huge, guys. Millions of people in this thing. It was giant. And Mordecai was not bowing to Haman, and it set him off so bad that he wanted to kill every Jew. Guys, this is mass genocide. Huge. If you think Hitler killed a lot of Jews, look at, the, at what Haman's plan was for mass genocide that he wanted to do. The only problem is that Haman had to come up with a slick way to trick the king into letting him execute this plan. He needed the authority to do it. So here he goes, Esther 3 and 8. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from all other peoples, and they do not keep the king's laws. Therefore, it is not fitting for the king to let them remain. If it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they be destroyed. Okay, the Jews were not outlaws. They were abiding people. They did what the Persian law said. Haman lied. Now, what is Satan's language? Lying. If you are a liar, you're speaking Satan's language. You need to speak your father's language. Whoever your father is, you're going to speak his language. I try to speak the truth because God is my father. I try, don't lie. That's the devil's language. Don't do that. The Jews were not outlaws. Haman lied just like an Amalekite terrorist would. Now, this was, guys, I want you all to understand that this was Satan's attempt to kill all the Jews. Because if the Jews don't exist, then God would be a liar because God has promised many, many things that would come through the Jewish people. And that's why they're still against Israel today. If they can wipe Israel out and take out all the Jews, then all the promises that God said would come through the Jewish people ain't coming true. God's a liar. You don't need to believe in God. It's all shot. If all the Jews had been killed from the earth, then even the Davidic covenant would be cut off, preventing our salvation through Jesus, the Jewish Messiah. Do you see how from this, what Haman's trying to do, Haman tried to cut off your chance at being saved. Do you see that? Okay, he tried, to cut, he tried to steal your salvation from you. The Jewish Messiah, Jesus, he's from, of the Jews. In fact, Esther herself was a direct descendant of King David's line. Haman lied to the king. Big, bold-faced lie. Esther 3 and 10. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamedatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. 
Okay, the passing of a signet ring was the passing of authority. When you did a document and, and, uh, or a decree, you would put wax on it and you would push that signet ring in there and it would have a royal seal on it. That means this is now bound. You can't undo it. It's as it is because it's got royal authority on top of it. So now Haman, he's got the signet ring. Haman was given all the authority he needed to draft his decree to have all the Jews in the whole empire destroyed. So Haman got together with his advisors to decide when to execute this murderous plan. Esther 3 and 7. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast pure. See that? What, what's today? This is Purim. Okay, they cast pure, that is the lot, which means like dice or something like it. So they cast pure, that is the lot, before Haman to determine the day, the month, and the month until it fell on the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. Okay, why did they throw lots? Maybe they're, I mean, you, you got terrorists here that they can't agree, probably. There must have been a disagreement in Haman's camp, cabinet or something on when to set this plan off. So they threw lots to decide when. Now, the Hebrew word for lot, like dice, is pure, okay? But the plural is Purim. And this is where we get the name of the Feast of Purim. Esther 3, verse 12. In the name of King Ahasuerus, it was written and sealed with the king's signet ring. And the letters were sent by couriers into all the king's provinces to destroy to kill and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, little children and women in one day. So papers went out. Here comes their annihilation day. And all the Jews are going to be destroyed. Everybody in the kingdom that, want, that hated the Jews, here's your permission. You get to kill every Jew you see and everybody do it. So they, they let the whole empire know about it. So here comes their annihilation day. And that was going to be within about one year from this time. But, but we still have Mordecai, okay? We still have Mordecai, who is a known Jew, who had saved the king's life from assassination, plus his daughter Esther, she's a Jew, nobody knows yet, but she's the queen, and they're right under the king's nose. Something really big is about to clash, isn't it? So Haman had letters sent out all over the kingdom to terrify the Jews about their execution date that was coming up. Meanwhile, behind the palace walls, Esther had no idea this was going on. She's back there doing her royal stuff as queen. And so Mordecai sent a copy of the decree to her to see it for herself. And Mordecai also sent her a message that it's probably now the time to reveal that you're Jewish. You probably better say something. If there was a time to say it, it should be now. So Esther replied back to him in Esther 4 and 10. Then Esther spoke to Hathach and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death, except the one whom the king holds out the golden scepter, that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called in to go in to see the king these 30 days. Okay, so he's like, you need to say you're a Jew. You need to go talk to the king. She goes, I can't just go in there. It was a serious breach of royal protocol for anybody to approach the king without being invited. If he didn't extend his scepter to you, that was the invitation. Uh, only the, if the king chose to extend his scepter to that person, then they were spared from being condemned from, from death. Now, scepters, that staff that the kings hold in their hand, it's held by a ruler. It is a symbol of authority. So Esther's problem here is she hasn't seen the king in 30 days. She hasn't seen the king for a month, and she hasn't been asked to go and see the king. So she can't just march right in to see him because according to Persian law, her entry could be taken as a disrespectful intrusion with the penalty of death. The king already had Queen Vashti taken off the throne. She could be killed for walking in there and say, hey, I got something I need to tell you right now. So here's the next problem, right? She can't just go in there. Esther 4 and 13. And Mordecai told them to answer, Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, 
relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. <laughs> so Mordecai basically stated, look, the Jews are going to be saved one way or another. God is going to fight for his people. But if you don't speak up and if you don't say that you're a Jew, if the king does not kill you for violation of protocol, then the decree will kill you instead. You better say something now. You're going to die from breach of royal protocol or from the decree. Either way, you're not safe behind the palace walls. Once they find out, you're gone. So you better say something and at least take that chance because maybe the Lord God put you here to save all the people. I think that was wisdom. <laughs> so speak up. <laughs> so however, if you do speak up, God probably installed you as queen just to save everybody. So Esther replied back to Mordecai. In Esther 4.16, she says, fast for me. Look at that. She's going right into prayer. Guys, this is how you get through tough times. You, you put in a tough spot, this is how you react, okay? She says, fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. This, this woman's brave. She's going to stand for the defense of her people. Nice. Esther 5 and 1. Check this out. Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace across from the king's house, while the king sat on his royal throne in the royal house, facing the entrance of the house. So it was when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court that he killed her. No, God's involved in this, guys. Watch this. <laughs> that she found favor in his sight and the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Yes, this is exciting. <laughs> you just know God's doing this. He has to be. So she found favor with the king and so she was not going to be condemned to die. So the king let her say whatever was on her mind. So Esther says, hey, I, I want to have a banquet and I want y'all both to come. And now she's so, ex Haman's so excited about this. And, ha and Haman, oh, he is just, oh, I am the best thing. I got invited to the royal banquet. I must be something else. The king and queen want me at their party. Mm, I am going where you can't go. I am something. Esther 5 and 9. So Haman went out that day joyful and with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate and that he did not stand or tremble before him, he was filled with indignation against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home, and he sent and called for his friends and his wife Zeresh. Then Haman told them of his great riches, the multitude of his children, everything in which the king had promoted him, and how he had advanced him above the officials and servants. Of the king. Moreover, Haman said, Besides, Queen Esther invited no one but me to come in with the king to the banquet that she prepared, and tomorrow I am again invited by her along with the king. Yet all this avails me nothing so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. This guy is just mad. He's upset about Mordecai. Verse 14. Then his wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, Let a gallows be made, fifty cubits high, and in the morning suggest to the king that Mordecai be hanged on it. Then go merrily with the king to the banquet. Uh, I don't think so. And the thing pleased Haman, so he had the gallows made. Okay, guys, Haman has no idea what he's walking into. <laughs> He has no idea the trap that he's coming into. And this trap is of the Lord's own doing. What's the Lord intervene here? Check this out. Esther 6 and 1. Something just happens to go down. Watch this. That night the king could not sleep. So one was commanded to bring the book of the records of the Chronicles, and they were read before the king. Those records must be boring. Maybe they thought they'd put him to sleep. I don't know. Verse 2. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, the doorkeepers who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. Then the king said, What honor and dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's servants who attended him said, Nothing has been done for him. So the Lord kept the king up at night. Okay, that we see that. 
So they brought the law and they just happened to find this this part in the in all the records. The Lord directed the king's men to land right on Mordecai's record of what Mordecai did to save the king's life. So apparently the king didn't know, I guess, that it was Mordecai who had saved his life from this assassination plot. So the king said, hey, we've got to send somebody to reward Mordecai for his loyalty. We got to find somebody to go and honor this guy. <laughs> who do you think is going to have to do this? <laughs> Esther 6 and 4. So the king said, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court. Here I am. I love this story, guys. I mean, this is just good. <laughs> now, Haman just entered the outer court of the king's palace to suggest that the king hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. The king's servant said to him, Haman's there, standing in court. Let's go get him. <laughs> and the king said, let him come in. So Haman came in and the king asked him, what shall be done for the man whom the king delights to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? He thinks he's talking about him. Verse 7, and Haman answered the king, for the man whom the king delights to honor, let a royal robe be brought which the king has worn, and a horse on which the king has ridden, which has a royal crest placed on its head. Then let this robe and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that he may array the man whom the king delights to honor. <laughs> then parade him on horseback through the city square and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Then the king said to Haman, Hurry, take the robe and the horse as you have suggested and do so for Mordecai the Jew. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Do this for Mordecai the Jew who sits at the king's gate. Leave nothing undone all that you have spoken. But Haman's like, I should have shut my mouth, man. Verse 11. So Haman took the robe and the horse, arrayed Mordecai, and led him on horseback through the city square and proclaimed before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. I bet he just loved having to do that. <laughs> Friends, this is what pride will do to you. This is what being prideful, thinking you're so hot, you're so awesome, I'm the best thing there ever was. This is what happens to you. Scripture says that God opposes the proud but he gives grace to the humble. Mordecai didn't run around looking to be glorified. Hey, I saved your life, king. Why don't you do something for me? Mordecai didn't care. He was humble. These guys are complete opposites. One got lifted up. One got pushed down. But can you imagine just how much it burned Haman up to have to do this to Mordecai, to parade him around with honor? The one man on the entire earth that refused to bow to Haman is the one that Haman was forced to give honor to. And that's something else. God has a way of telling you how things are going to be. We don't tell God, right? So Mordecai was raised up, but Haman was humiliated down, and he ran home to cry to his family about it. And he was playing the victim card. But guys, get this. While he was whining, while he was, oh, what I had to do, while he was whining, the king's people showed up to take him to Esther's banquet. Oh, it ain't over with you yet, Haman. <laughs> So now we're at the banquet with Esther, Haman, and the king. He's still feeling terrible. He didn't even get to get his complaining out. And Esther finally speaks up for her people and tells the king her true identity. Esther 7 and 4, she tells him, For we have been sold, my people and I. She's talking about the Jews. She just right there said, I'm a Jew, right in front of Haman. For we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Had we been sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. So King Ahasuerus answered and said to Queen Esther, Who is he, and where is he? Who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? And Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. So Haman was terrified before the king and queen. Then the king arose in his wrath from the banquet of wine and went into the palace garden. But Haman stood before the queen 
before Queen Esther, pleading for his life, for he saw that evil was determined against him by the king. When the king returned from the palace garden to the place of the banquet of wine, Haman had fallen across the couch where Esther was. Then the king said, will he also assault the queen while I'm in the house? As the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Now Harbona, one of the eunuchs, said to the king, look, the gallows 50 cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on the king's behalf, is standing at the house of Haman. Then the king said, hang him on it. Bam! Oh, I want to laugh, but man, I want to shudder too. Hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath subsided. Haman is gone. He's out of here. He intended for the Jews to be killed, but Haman died on his own gallows that he himself had built. His plans of pride hung him. Proud person, if you're <laughs> whoever's hearing me, all the plans you build based on your pride, you're going to hang on it. I would probably disengage that project and see what the Lord would rather you do for him instead of your own stuff. But that's a little side note. But what a pathetic way to go. But guys, there's still a problem. We still, it's not done. There's still a problem. Persian law says that when you, once you pass a decree, it can't be undone. Not even the king can do it. When you pass a decree and send it out, it's out there. It's that annihilation day for the Jews is still coming. He's, it was sealed with the royal ring and everything. It's, it's still active. That old decree to annihilate the Jews is still out there with a set date on it. So the king told Mordecai and Esther, I want you to go write a new decree. And a new decree that will counter the old decree, giving the Jews a way to be saved. Esther 8 and 2. So the king took off his signet ring, which he had, given, had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed Mordecai over the house of Haman. Remember all the stuff Haman was bragging about that he had? Okay, look who's got it now, right? Verse 8. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and Mordecai the Jew, You yourselves write a decree concerning the Jews as you please in the king's name and seal it with the king's signet ring for whatever is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's signet ring no one can revoke okay so that signet ring of authority that Haman used to have has now been passed to Mordecai and Esther so they drafted a new decree a new a new decree to go out giving the Jews permission to kill anybody who had assaulted them and they sealed it with the authority of the king's signet ring. And they ran copies of that decree out to all over the empire as fast as they could. So everybody would have been scared of the first decree. Now they got another one. Well, wait a minute. One decree was going to kill us. Now this decree is going to save us, right? Esther 9 and 1 says, The time came for the king's command and his decree to be executed. On the day that the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, the opposite occurred, and that the Jews themselves overpowered those who hated them. <laughs> Back in your face. Okay, it finally came down, but the Jews were given a new decree. One question, though, how did the Jews overpower all these people? Well, because Mordecai had been promoted by the king, he instructed the king's, the king's military to help the Jews fight. So this was not just the Jews fighting. This was also the king's military helping them. That was in the new decree that went out to save them. Nice. So the fear of Mordecai fell on the Jews' enemies. So Mordecai instituted from this the Feast of Purim. Remember, Purim was, means the plural for lots that Haman threw for their death day. He instituted the Feast of Purim to be reminded every year of the lots that were thrown to choose the day that all the Jews would be killed. But now that day was turned from sorrow into joy for them because the Lord God fights for his people and the Lord God wants to save his people. Isn't that great? Esther 9.26, so they called these days Purim after the name Pure. Friends, I want you to take one thing from here. The Lord God saves his people. 
So I want you to watch this next part about Purim very, very closely. Okay, check this out. We're getting into some theological stuff here. Esther 9.27. The Jews established and deposed it upon themselves and their descendants and all who would join them. If you're a Gentile, not a Jew like me, you need to underline that right there where it says they're, all their descendants and all who would join them. That all who would join them, that includes you and me. Ray, this is a very Jewish Purim I've never heard of. Hey, before I understood the Jewishness of our faith, I hadn't heard of Purim either. But it says, you Gentiles, me Gentile, we get to jump into this, right? And all who would join them, that without fail, they should celebrate these two days every year. Okay, the Bible says celebrate Purim every year. I've never heard of Purim. Uh, Let's read the Bible and find out what God wants us to do and let's do it. Okay, that's why we're celebrating it today. So this says the Feast of Purim should be kept, and not just for the Jews, but who else? All who would join them. Friends, I'm a Gentile. I'm not Jewish that I know about, and this Jewish holiday is also for me. This is mine too. And I believe we should join the Jews in this this feast. First off, our salvation is from the Jews. Jesus even said so in John 4, 22. He said, salvation comes from the Jews. Friends, Jesus is a Jew. I don't know if you knew that or not, but he's a Jew, okay? So let me put this whole story into a Jesus parallel for you. First off, I want us to, be, uh, to understand some very important things. Romans three twenty three says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, And Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. I am a sinner. Some people believe pastors are perfect. Oh, good Lord, you've got to be kidding me. I'm a sinner. Anybody in here think, well, you're not a sinner like me, Ray. Yes, I am. I have sinned. I have done bad things in my life. And God's law says, if you sin, you die. That's God's law. I just showed it to you. The wages of sin is death. You should die. You earned that because you're a sinner. I'm not just pointing at you. I'm talking about me. I sinned. I should be dead. I should be condemned. As a matter of fact, our best righteousness, the Bible says, is like filthy rags unto God. And God's law against us is still out there, guys. God's law against our sin is still out there. It has not been revoked. It's just like that first royal decree that was sent out. Its purpose was to annihilate all those who were lawless. And for any of us sinners who try to walk into the presence of God, our Lord and our King, we can't just walk in there as sinners. If we were to just go in there to the King, that would be a serious breach of royal protocol. We can't approach the Lord God. We can't just go in there. We're the sinner. Habakkuk 1.13 says of the Lord, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. I'm just going to go to God. You can't. Well, what am I supposed to do? I'm getting to the good news. Just hang on. We're getting there. But guys, the first thing we need to understand, if you really want to get saved, you first need to understand the sinner that you are, that I am. We're sinners. We just blew it, guys. Let's just, let's just swallow that. Don't beat yourself up over the mistakes you've made. I'm not doing that. I'm a sinner, but I'm a forgiven sinner, okay? But there's the judgment day out there of God's law. So basically, there's an upcoming day that has been set for our annihilation, for our destruction. It's called judgment day. And not one of us sinners is going to survive it. Every last one of us are doomed for condemnation. We cannot approach our King Jesus unless the King invites you. Oh, oh, I see Esther playing out now. You can't go into that King's throne room unless he asks you to come. Remember how King Ahasuerus found favor with Esther, so he held out his his scepter to her. That was the invitation to come to him. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, "Come to me, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest." Friend, that is your invitation by the King. He says, I invite you to come in. (laughs) That's our invitation. Okay, good. I get to go in. But wait a minute. Hang on. 
There's something we read that Esther did that I want to show you. It was easy to skip over. I want to point out something to you. There's something Esther did first before she went into the king. Chapter 5 says that before she went into the presence of the king, she first put on royal robes. Do you remember reading that? But she didn't just march right in. She got dressed, man. She got this royal robe. She put it was probably purple and you know just royal color and got dressed. Isaiah 61:10 says, "I will re- will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with a robe of righteousness." You got to get dressed with that before you get to go in to see the king. The book of Romans says we should put on Christ. Like when you put on your clothes, you, you put on Christ. That means no more you, no more this proud Haman, oh, look how awesome I am. No, you take that off and you put on Christ and get clothed in his righteousness. Because friends, I'll tell you, you and I have no righteousness at all. We, we have none. We're bankrupt. We, we just don't, stop thinking you're so great. Man, I can't believe I got a pastor telling me how terrible I am. Well, we read it. We're sinners and we deserve death. I'm just being truthful with you. The only shot you have at all of being saved at all, the only way you can do anything good at all is because of the righteousness that the Lord God wants to clothe you with. But you got to put that on. Revelation says that believers will wear fine linen in holy righteousness. Friends, if you want the king of kings to find favor with you, you can't just go into him as you are. You first have to put on the royalty of Jesus Christ. You have to put on the righteousness of Jesus. He is, Jesus Christ is the only garment that you can wear that our king will find favor with on you. He's it. If you ain't wearing Jesus, you're not getting an invitation to come in. But did you notice in the story how some people were killed while others were saved? We had two decrees out there. Some people were killed. Some people were saved. Those who got under Haman's law of destruction, they all died. But those who chose to get under Mordecai's new and better saving law, they all lived. Now, I want you to watch this. Check this out. The Bible says of Jesus in Hebrews 8 and 6, it says, But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant. It's better than the one that was already out there. A better covenant which was established on better promises. (laughs) Jesus once said, All authority has been given to me. Just like how that signet ring was passed over to Mordecai. So Jesus had all the authority so that Jesus could draft up a brand new covenant that would save us from the covenant that was out there that was going to kill us. That first covenant was going to kill you. And so Jesus says, let me have the signet ring. I'll send out another covenant. And he sent that one out to save you. Save us from our sin. God's old law is still out there, friends. I don't want you to be mistaken. I want you to understand that God's old law that's going to kill people, the sinful, it is still out there and it will not be revoked. It is out there to kill you for your sin. And everyone who refuses to get under the blood of Jesus will be caught by God's condemning destructive law. But for those of us who have put on Jesus, who decide to get under the new covenant, Romans 6.14 says, Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Oh, ah. you know why we're partying today? Can you see this? Because God says, I don't want you to be destroyed. I want you to be saved. Isn't that great? Under the old law, we were all going to die, guys. But just like how Mordecai and Esther worked on a better decree, Jesus worked out for our better covenant of grace, not for our destruction, but for our salvation. So can you see why Purim is offered not just to Jews, but to all who would join the Jews? Friend, are you you glad that you've been saved? Well, then this is your day to celebrate your salvation today on Purim. It's not just a celebration for them. Our salvation picture is in this story 
So yes, you better believe I'm celebrating Purim because I'm under the better covenant of Jesus Christ where I don't have destruction to look forward to. I have salvation under Jesus. I have victory. Amen. John 3.36 says, He who believes in the Son, Jesus, has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Y'all remember how the king was infuriated with Haman? How mad the king was, so he ordered, hang him. Hang him! I want you to think about that for a minute. Imagine standing in front of the king, and he looks at you and says, hang that person. You're toast, man. You're gone. So a wrathful king demands the death of the guilty. But I also want you to remember how we read in the text. It said that after they hanged Haman on the gallows. It says, after he hanged, the king's wrath subsided. You remember that? The king's wrath subsided after he died. Friends, if you want God's wrath against your sin to subside, you know what you have to do? You have to die. If you want the Lord God's wrath against you to go away, you have to die. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You want the king's wrath to subside? You need to be crucified with Christ. It's no longer about you anymore. It's no longer about your little empire that you're building for yourself like Haman. Oh, look what I have. Look what I've. That's just going to go into somebody else's hands like it went into Esther and Mordecai's. But friends, you've got to die. Why should we celebrate, celebrate Purim? Because if we die to our, our old self and if we put on Jesus, then we can find favor with our king who invites us to come in with him through the new and better covenant of the grace of Jesus Christ. Purim is just one more reason for us to celebrate our salvation. Isn't that exciting? I would like to ask all of you, if you want to, go home today, pick up the book of Esther and read the whole thing. And there's a lot of stuff I skipped. You need to see all of it. This story is really, really cool. But our salvation's in this. So uh, I want to show you a Purim rap video. Yes, sung by Jews, actually. I want to show you this. This is what they're singing right now. Check this out. Sooner will we pour them in again. People want to do as evil like they tried to do way back then. But we're God's sons. God is one. He will do to them what he did to all mine. Yes, we've got the right God. They just everyone together now. We got the rock of ages. Hey, don't make us any trouble, cause the rock of ages, he can knock off your block till eternity. If you mess with the Jews, you're bound to lose. God will make another Jewish holiday from you. So we've got the rock. You know that Purim is the holiday when all the Jews say If you're happy, God will slay all of your enemies Don't be afraid, no need to cry God will turn your troubles to a bundle of joy So we've got the rock of ages We've got the rock of ages Anti-Semitism is another way of saying That you hate the creator of the universe That's what our enemies said now they're dead. Come on, let's celebrate Purim instead. Hey, we got the rock of ages. Everyone together now. No, we got the rock of ages. One more time. Hey, we got the rock of ages. Woo, we got the rock of ages. We. Got the rock of ages. Amen. Aren't y'all excited? You know, the Jews have a saying they tried, they died. Let's eat. 
We're going to do that too. <laughs> Father, thank you for your word today. Uh, we're going to celebrate our salvation. Lord, we just thank you. That, gosh, you didn't even have to do this for us because we're so unworthy. You could have just left us alone and said, no, you messed up. Too bad for you. But no, you came to save us because you didn't want us to be destroyed. Thank you, Lord. For anybody here, you want to know how to get, well, Ray, how do I do it? How do I do it? What ceremony? It's not a ceremony. You just need to believe. Here's how you do it. Just follow me. I'll pray with you. You pray. If you, if you want to get saved right now, you don't want God's wrath against you for your sin. You know you've messed up. You know you haven't yet fixed the problem. Here's where your solution comes. Pray with me. Just do this. Father, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. I messed up. I messed up bad. And I don't want to suffer your wrath. Thank you for sending Jesus for that new covenant that he died on the cross and paid the death penalty that I was supposed to take. He paid it for me so that I could be free. I give you my life, Lord Jesus. I will follow you. I will pursue you. It's no longer about me. I now get rid of my pride. I put on your son, Jesus. Thank you for coming after me. I give you my life. It is yours now. Take it and do what you want with it. Thank you for the invitation of eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer, you just got saved right where you are. Right now, you just crossed over from death to life. You crossed over from judgment to grace. And now, Father, God's wrath against you will now subside. <laughs>